Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this afternoon we have a special session of two seminars related to the to the IFIS Exploratory Workshop that uh, is taking place during these two days, where we have visitors from uh, different uh, institutions belonging to some Spanish institutions and some German, and uh, this is from the Netherlands and Scotland. And we have two invited talks. The first one by Bob Van Dijk from the Free University of uh, Medical Center in Amsterdam. Bob is, uh, got a PhD in physics in Amsterdam in the 18, 1985, uh, working in color vision, which is electrophysiology of uh, out layer of the retina. In 1985, he moved to, have, to Japan in the Institute of Physiological Science, where he did a postdoc. It was a continuation of his uh, PhD work. In 1986, he came back to the Netherlands, working in the Ophthalmic Research Institute, uh, working in motion processing in awake monkeys. In 87 and 88, he was at the Rockefeller University in New York, working in motion, motion pathway in cats and monkey. And uh, he go back to the, went back to the, uh, the Netherlands in 1988, in the University of Amsterdam, in the medical physics, working in high density electro electroencephalography, and he started the interest in synchronization properties or aspects. Uh, in 1997 to 2004, he was director of the MEG Center in Amsterdam, and since 2004, he is a senior researcher at the Physics and Medical Technological Medical Center of the Free University, and uh, his main interests are in dynamics of cortical activity, networks, and cognition. So, Bob, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to say it's always a pleasure to be in Spain. That, and you would make the pleasure a bit larger for me. If whenever I say something that you don't understand, ask me what do you mean. So it's, it's, it's a bit dull to, to talk to faces and some people getting sleepy without anybody showing any sign of interest. So. Okay, what I'm going to talk about uh, now is um, magnetoencephalography data on patients with Alzheimer's disease and in controls. And um, basically what we have been trying to do in Amsterdam has two goals with, with this patient group. First of all, it's obvious that if you want to do something against um, Alzheimer's disease, you will have to diagnose the disease quite early. So early diagnosis um, will be essential if you want to try out treatments. So that's goal number one. Um, another very important goal is, is that actually we have not a very good idea of what Alzheimer's disease is actually really doing. So we don't have an idea of the disease mechanism as yet. Um, so maybe by using data in, in, a, in a way that I will show you in a minute, we can get some clue on what's happening in Alzheimer's brains and get clues on how to further study cellular mechanisms. Um, Data that I will show you today are basically from two projects. One, what we call the pilot subject, this was from a very small group, and the other one, a slightly larger group study, was done later in a be better controlled fashion. Um, 
We always use for these all these data the same MG system. I hope you're familiar with what MG is. We use the CTF system which, which has 151 radial radiometers. We started off using uh, both task data and a very so asking the subjects to recognize words that they had memorized within the scanner and asking them to recognize faces uh, of which they also had first to learn while in the scanner, which was pretty time consuming and you know Alzheimer patients are not the easiest group of subjects to work with. Not because they're very stubborn, but they're very difficult to learn something new. So for instance a typical example is that we um, would ask them to uh, say whether they knew a face or not, they had seen it before or not, but then wait with giving the answer until we specifically instructed them to give the answer. And the typical Alzheimer behavior is to immediately say, yes, I know this face, instead of waiting four or five seconds longer, so that we have all these artifacts. Um, what we found out in the pilot phase is actually that the most informative data was what we got when we asked the subject not to do a particular task, but simply sit in the scanner, mark this sit, uh, with your eyes closed, and sit as still as possible. Um, so in the final study, this is exactly the only thing that the subjects had to do. They had to sit in the scanner with their eyes closed for five minutes. That's all. So it's pretty simple. And then the next question is, of course, why do I think it's this is the most interesting part? Well, I always like this description of the brain. I'm a physicist by training, as you know. Now. Our brains are weakly disturbed systems. It sounds nice and it's also true in, in the sense that most of our brain is talking to itself. So if you want to know how the brain is functioning, you don't have to do anything, but simply let the brain talk to itself and see how it does that. Okay. Um, when we started doing this, there are already a lot of uh, things were known about how the ongoing EEG or energy in Alzheimer patients is different from that of healthy controls. Uh, there is typically a decrease in power in the lower alpha and the lower beta bands, so say from 8 to 10 hertz and uh, from 12 to 20 hertz. You see uh, a diminished coherence, actually you see that in all frequency bands are pretty widespread all over the head. If you look at the as you know, if you look at an alpha, I don't really don't know your background. So if you look at an alpha rhythm, it typically it's, it's not a 10 hertz for minutes, it's, it's for a few seconds or a fraction of a second. You get 10 hertz oscillation and then it dies out and then you get a new oscillation. The length of those bursts of oscillatory activity gets longer with longer periods of silence in between in Alzheimer patients. And the amount of variability. Um, so the, 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 the different, especially the topology of the, of, the, of the band goes down. So it's more stereotype patterns of almost always the same length and the same appearance. Excuse me, what, what do you refer by coherence? Or coherence? Co uh, coherence is uh, the, the, uh, the correlation between the power uh, and the spectrum of two signals. So is the correlation between the different bands? No, within the frequency band. So it's the time for the time the it's the 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 correlation time, for example. Yeah, it's it's yeah. So you um, it's a it's the frequency image of the correlation function. Uh, the, as I, as I showed here, um, you get different behaviors in different frequency bands. So it makes sense to look at coherence. So see mm -hmm. how the correlations are different in different frequencies instead of directly looking at correlations. Um, this is one paper uh, from our group showing that almost all of this, the, the, the findings that I've shown in the previous slide are also seen with our population of patients um, 
and are almost all significant. And we published that in class last year. Um, but this is um, well, it's something to show that indeed, if you have patient in a patient group, um, that that group has different signals than the control group. But I want we wanted to go a bit further, and that is, as I said, we want to understand what's happening in these brains. And simply looking at power spectra uh, is not, in our mind, not going to help. Because the reason for that is that uh, we believe, and I'm, I'm afraid this is nothing more than a belief so far, but that much of what the brain is doing can be understood only in terms of networks, instead of different modules, each doing uh, different things. Much of what our brain is doing is that it's functioning as a network. A network requiring the coordination of a scattered mosaics of functionally specialized brain regions. I think that's pretty nicely put by Francisco Varela. So, um, yeah, sure, if you give a subject certain tasks to do, you can find different modules in the brain each specialized for a certain function. But if you're looking at the way the brain integrates information, or if you look at how the brain is working with more um, difficult or complex tasks, you can only come far, is our belief, if you really look at how the brain behaves as a whole. So we have to describe how the network is our goal now, and how is the network of Alzheimer's disease patients different from the network of control subjects. Okay, um, if we want to do that, then what we have to do is to measure synchrony. So, um, if, if you want to describe the brain as a network, what you have to measure is how all the nodes in the network interact. One way to do that is by measuring whether the nodes in the network are synchronous. This is called, in the electrophysiological world, world, world nowadays, functional connectivity. So basically, what you're measuring is whether two regions are acting together. This is what we mean by the word synchrony. So what you're looking for are pairwise correlations. And I put this. Uh, between quotation marks, oops, between quotation marks, because you can measure correlations in very many different ways. Okay, if you do that, what you get is for every pair of sensors, basically, and for every epoch, you get one value. This is data multiplication. We started off with 151 channels, which got 1,000 samples per second. Now we have 151 square singular values. And to display or analyze them, you can either average over time, over space, over frequency, or combinations of those, or better yet, find some other statistical man man uh, measure that combines all these averages. Mm -hmm. So we want to get to a, a number, a value, that describes a network property of an outside value. But we, we don't want to compare directly the full correlation matrices. Just to show you approximately what, what I'm trying to make. This is not Alzheimer's data, this is a healthy control subject. This is not uh, no, this is not MEG, this is EEG. But just to get the message across on how we see in our mind how the brain is working. This is, a, this is a task, so this is not even nice close data. The task is the subject sits for 16 seconds looking at the blank screen. Then for a short period, one second, subject is looking at this picture. Really somebody is holding one piece of paper with that picture on it. 
Picture is taken away, subject is looking at the blank space again, and then is asked, what did you see? A uh, simple task, right? And easy if you want to find if somebody has memory problems, you also, this number tells you whether he's good in memorizing vision stuff. Now this box shows the synchrony during this phase where there was no stimulus. This box shows the synchrony in the phase where there was no stimulus. But the subject was actively remembering what did I see, what did I see. Because the subject knew here he would have to say something, otherwise he would be stupid. Um, what do I measure here? Now these are 20, uh, the, the signals are 20 electrons, it's on the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is time, so it's 16 seconds, as I just told you. And with this pseudo color scale, what I'm plotting here is how synchronous, and this is using synchronization likelihood, how synchronous at this time epoch this electrode was with all the other electrodes that you're reporting from. And as you see, if you're not doing very much, it's not this is this is actually not noise because our noise level is much larger. But there are certain at certain points there is more synchrony and certain mm -hmm. electrodes are more interested in the rest of the brain than others. But there isn't much going on. Oops. When you're memorizing stuff, there's lots more variation in synchrony. But it's almost at every electrode that you're recording from, you see these, these variation in synchrony occur. You see there's different colors here, so different amounts of synchronization. So, so red is larger the degree of synchronization? Yeah, with red you have more synchronization, and blue means that this, uh, this electrode at any point in time, there is hardly any synchronization with other electrodes, the signals of other electrodes. So we can learn two things. This is why I showed it. It's not really something that is spatially localized. There is not a, in this experiment. It's not completely visible that there is a memory center where you're memorizing visual stuff. There is also not, not time-wise, it's very very. So, so um, the, the amount of synchronization, synchronization varies strongly all the time. Okay, now you can do um, you, and you can. So this is the same data again. You can also look. So you can compare those two situations for different frequency bands, and then can show. As I, this is why we're using coherence often, that in different frequency bands, these changes in synchronization are different. Especially there is a difference between what's happening in the lower frequencies and in the middle and higher frequencies. So, memory is expressed different in different frequency bands. In the brain. What do we see? What are the blue and the brown box? Okay, so we have here what's called resting state. This is resting state with memory or while memorizing. So the blue is when you're waiting for your stimulus, and red is when you're waiting for the question to come, what did you see? And what's the difference? And the difference is that here I have the synchronization for that particular frequency band for those two conditions. Yeah, but more or less the same in both cases. It's more, yeah, you can say all these things are more or less the same. But, um, okay, let's put it this way. There is not, there, there is obviously a difference between those two pictures. Secondly, there isn't much very difference between not a systematic difference between different electrodes. It's also from the previous version. Thirdly, I see increases in synchronization in low frequencies. I see decreases in synchronization in higher frequencies. And well, that you have to believe 
almost all of these differences are uh, uh, significant. I, I didn't put asterisks here, but you have to believe it here. Uh, the noise level is very small. And this again tells, tells you two things. First of all, the brain is mostly looking at itself. And secondly, if you instruct the subject to do something, which is just nice actually that you ask this question, if you instruct this, the, the subject to do something, the brain activity isn't changing that much. And if, if you, yeah, you're right, all these things, there's hardly any difference between the two conditions. But that's because most of the brain is not necessary to memorize such a very simple small number of objects. Beyond all that, I would say that, that it's difficult to say that the, the, the upper picture and the bottom pictures represent the same phenomena. Because, mm -hmm. as you say, the two, different, the two pictures on the bottom are, very, are clearly different, while in the upper part, the difference is yeah. barely seen. So, yeah. so they don't, they don't actually really reflect this, the same phenomena. No, they do. Actually, this picture is coming from a lower beta. So it's actually, it's this, it's this pair of bars. This is the difference between those two pictures. But again, we can see this because, the, why is this different? Because there's only a short period in time where there's lots of synchronization in the rest of the time. If this, the other if this wasn't there, oops. If this column wasn't there, it would be the same. It would be the same. So it's only very, very, very short period of time that there's a difference. And with respect to the question, what happens if you change the time and you wait to to to, to ask again? What happens, for instance, if you ask before the the burst? of signal or in the burst of signal? Oh, good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, our, 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 our way to calculate this is so stupidly slow that it would be difficult to really do this. So, so we... But yeah. No, because the failure to recognize probably decreases in time, right? Or increases, in fact, the failure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, if you wait longer, it will... It will uh, the performance gets worse, although there, there are some strange phenomena there as well. Um, okay. Well, for instance, if you if you do this for if you do this, we did this with faces, so you have to recognize face name combination. Then people get very tired. Say so after 100 faces learned, you really are tired, and then. Um, the performance goes down and the modulation goes down. Then you say to the person, to the subject, uh, uh, take a nap of an hour. You don't give the new stimulus. Then the modulation is back and the memory is back. So it's just those are very good for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, other subject. Um, so th this memory experiment is to, to bring across two points. The brain is not changing very much in behavior with different tasks to do or whatever you want, uh, what sort of experiment you want to do. Most of its behavior is determined by itself. So um, I, I have very often seen people describing, for instance, an fMR experiment saying, well, I now see uh, a contrast between an active and a resting period as if the brain was doing nothing and then there's this bright spot and now it was suddenly there there was something happening. This is natural. The brain is always active and it's hardly changing at all. Secondly, uh, there is hard, there is the emphasis on regional specialization is there because we use stimuli to probe the brain. If you're not using stimuli, you have to work with these resting state networks. The resting state networks are very diffuse. Whatever technique you use to measure resting state networks, they are diffuse. Those were the points I wanted to make. Um, so what happens for Alzheimer's disease? In words, synchronization decreases and the variation in synchrony decreases. So, first synchronization decreases. So this is simply comparing a group of Alzheimer's with a group of controls. Both during the same task, they sit still with their arms closed. So what's happening is that, again, in different frequency bands, we have different <coughs> behaviors. But typically, for almost all frequency bands, there is a 
decreased synchronization. And these three bars, they're pairs of bars, the differences are significant. This one is not significant. And if you look, what's most promising is if you look at the gamma band, so this is a, a healthy control. And, um, I hope the image I just gave you is sort of in your memory now. So this, again, is a period of only 16 seconds sitting there with your eyes closed. And this is now energy data. So this is uh, well, all, all, the, 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 all the energy channels except the ones at the midline. Something like 125 channels in the CTR system. And these little white boxes I drew. Um, and this, we think, are reflections of synchronous cell assemblies, meaning to say that there are certain periods, sh short periods of time, fractions of seconds, where there is an increased synchronization or decreased synchronization in only a few channels, showing up for that small period of time, this piece of brain is interested in this piece of brain. And then that disappears and comes back again. This is for a healthy brain. If you look at the gamma band, if you sit with your eyes closed, your, your brain is doing all sorts of things, you're thinking of all sorts of things. And what you see is this huge variation from time to time. And uh, it depends a bit on which correlation measure you take, but correlations are low. It's not going to one, it's uh, between zero and zero point two. So this is, most of the brain is interested in something obscure. This is the same data, but now, so this is a healthy control. This is a typical Alzheimer's patient. So there's two things. There's a decreased synchronization. I've shown you that two slides ago. But there's also much less variation. This, this appearance of cell assemblies popping up and popping down is no longer there. And uh, I'll show that. This, this is, again, he saw both phenomena in, in, in the same picture. So if you compare healthy controls, you get a higher level of synchrony and a lot stronger synchronization variation than in Alzheimer's. Uh, does that depend on uh, the measure that you use? So in, in this, th these pictures, we use synchronization likelihood. Synchronization likelihood is a measure that tells you um, it's, it's a measure of nonlinear synchrony. It tells you how likely it is that there's, if there is a repetition of the behavior in one channel, that there is also repetition of behaviors in the other channel. So this particular form of synchronization that you're looking for, this is using phase-like index. Phase-like index um, actually is measuring phase the stability of, of non-zero phase differences between channels. And also if you look that if you take that, you get exactly the same behavior. So you get stronger variation in healthy controls and stronger signal in healthy controls. This might have gone a bit quick. Excuse me, there's so much detail. Okay. Um, the next step. So we now I've taken you from the record at 151 channels. We calculated um, the correlate, some different forms of correlations between all the channels. The next thing, and, and we had to filter to a particular frequency band because the different frequency bands have different behaviors. What we want to do is to give a, a description of this complete weighted graph such that the numbers uh, tell you something about the network behavior. Now, here we're using a cluster coefficient in path length. These are probably things you know. But anyway, so this is the way to go. So, again using the uh, face like index as the measure for correlation between pairs. So, how different, how do the, if, so I've shown you that the networks 
and the synchronizations are different, the next question is how do the networks differ? This is a paper from two years ago, two years ago showing you, first of all, the regional group differences in the phase like index. So this, again, is differences between Alzheimer's and controls. Um, showing you where, so at which sites, so with these blue things, uh, squares mean that this sites, this is where most of the uh, decrease in synchronization occurs. And the blue lines tells you between those two places most of the desynchronization occurs. You see that you get not only get different uh, overall changes in synchronization, you also get different regional differences in the different frequency bands. Uh, okay, so this was our first attempt on um, network descriptors. So an overall number to give you a statistic on how the networks change. What we so what we did is for so we measure the correlation and for every pair we get a correlation which is a weight between two nodes. So that's uh, the, the end result is then a graph with weighted connections. And we calculated for that graph, we calculated the cluster coefficient and the path length. Do you know what these things mean? I see most of the people nodding and I'm like shaking. <laughs> um, so what happens is that in Alzheimer's disease, and only for the lower alpha band we found a significant difference, and it was a bit disappointing. So is it within the within the arrow bar? No, no, no. The, the one, I mean, one point zero four one two zero seven, but what could be with one point zero one twelve? One point zero four one thirteen is within the arrow bar. Uh, the the the, the bold face is the only one that was a significant difference, and um, the rest was, as I said, a bit disappointing. In effect, I agree that it's small, but it is. Uh -huh. Okay, I mean one point zero four, and you say that it could be between one point zero two and one point twelve, compared to one point zero seven, which could be between one point zero four and one thirteen. This is within the arrow bar. That is within the, in the ranges of each other, sure. Uh, and obviously, this is not going to tell you for an individual subject whether he's going to have Alzheimer's or not. But if you're looking at group differences, this can be very well be significant. This is the data that we have. I'm not going to make it more pretty than it is. Um, but then, as promised, the next question is how. So, if the brain networks are different from for Alzheimer patients than for controls, can we find and learn from these a way how the damage occurs? And this we tested using a, a modeling study. So we, so what we did is, so we, we have this model where we, we have this data where we know the synchronization and variation in synchronization decrease. And we know at which sites this occurs. And we also know that, uh, that if you look at the network in alpha band only, that the Alzheimer data set has more random properties more the properties of the random network, whereas healthy controls more have a small world-like behavior of networks. Now, what then, the question then asked is, how can this difference occur? And we, so what we did is we built, simply built a model of uh, where we started off with the average with the, the network that we have for the healthy controls, and then we took out connections, or we decreased the connection strength between nodes in the model. We did that in two ways. We either did it at random, so we randomly selected the connection in the model and decreased it until the average synchronization of the control subjects was identical to that of Alzheimer's disease patients. Or we used those connections that come from a node that has a high connectivity. 
So we simply tested those two models. And of course, there are more options, but these are the two ones that we tried. And then the result was that if you go from Alzheimer's, so this is if you compare to controls to Alzheimer's. So if you go from here to there, you can go in two ways, either through trying to go through random mm -hmm. removal of nodes or remove those nodes that have many connections. And then if you look at the data, then the, for this data, model data, you have to correct that is similar to Alzheimer's disease patients clustering in pathways. So this is not really proving, but it's suggesting that in Alzheimer's disease networks, you have damage that is caused by targeted attack. So it's, it's those nodes which have many connections that for some reason are more prone to be damaged by the disease process. Oh, later. Um, so I, I've not only shown data from my own site, which is a bit um, <coughs> modest, but what is nice is that after we published this in Brain, uh, people who use structural MR in uh, Alzheimer subjects, and you can do the same network description using structural MR images, um, making correlations of cortical thickness, or whatever you want to do. And with this study, they found that if the, in Alzheimer disease brains, you also get the damage in those places where the MR-based networks have high connectivity. So there are two independent um, measures, you find exactly the same behavior. Moreover, if in these MR brains, at the, at, the, at the sites where you typically find hubs, so regions which have a high connectivity to other parts of the brain, those are the regions where you also find anatomical differences in uh, post mortem with the, the tangles and fibrils that are typical for Alzheimer's disease. So what we've learned is that for some reason, those nodes those parts in your brain that talk to many other parts in your brain or that have a high variation, because those two things are coupled, in the, the amount of information that is traveling with other part regions in your brain, those are, are damaged in Alzheimer's disease. Now that, of course, then brings up a very interesting question, why that is? So why is this correlation strength variation, is this high correlation strength, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, a, a problem by is Alzheimer's disease showing up in that respect. So the conclusion, brain of health control subjects is not stationary, dynamic, and complex. I've not really shown you. This is our way of thinking about the brain. And in Alzheimer's diseases, and already at early stages, oh, I didn't, I didn't dwell on that, I should have done that. Uh, um, we are looking, so the population of patients that we're looking at are the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the second group. Those are patients that came to the memory clinic um, because their spouse typically was uh, a bit suspicious about their uh, memory. Um, so they, these are people still living at home, um, can't take care of themselves. These are not people who are already institutionalized. And already in that stage, group-wise, we can find a strong correlation between what we see in MEG and what we get uh, from uh, other measures. In that group, wise comparison, we find that civilization decreases, like everybody does also with EEG. We see that the dynamics slows and freezes, but the brain network more strongly resembles a brain network structure. But that the damage does not occur everywhere at random connections, but suggests that it's mostly the hubs that are prone to damage. There are also other studies using MR that show exactly the same. But this is not my work, it's done in co co cooperation with a large amount of people. That's it. <coughs>
Which person is a, is a little bit from uh, from uh, the someone that reads things about this. As far as I know, Alzheimer. I mean, it's very difficult to diagnose in, in leaf patients. I mean, this yeah. is something you touch upon in the before last transparency of this post-mortem studies, the tangle of yeah. access and so on. So when when you do the experiment. I mean, you, you are based on, on patients that have, been, that have passed the, 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 the cognitive test and that says that it's Alzheimer compatible. How? I mean, do you later confirm? I mean, whether <coughs> post-mortem this was Alzheimer or was some compatible? No, no, we don't. Uh, 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 no, I understand exactly. You have a very wide variety. It, it is a very good question, and uh, <laughs> indeed, the only proof that the subject has Alzheimer is post-mortem. So. Uh, <laughs> You have to wait for the subject to die before you're sure about what's the disease. Um, the, the way it's organized in, in, in our place is that all subjects that go to the memory clinic get, a, get EEG, MEG, MR, psychological mm -hmm. testing, clinical, uh, so clinical story, uh, genetic, uh, familial, so the, the family, it's, it's other, other people in the family who have the same sort of problems. And this complete set of information is then used to reach what's called the consensus diagnosis. So if all the doctors involved agree that this is probably Alzheimer, who am I to doubt their judgment? Mm -hmm. It's as good as that. And how many of these subjects already died? I don't know. And whether then uh, that information is not in our study. Yes, okay. uh, if, if I remember correctly, the pattern of neuronal death as uh, Alzheimer's as Alzheimer's progresses, follows a well defined spatial temporal profile. No? I mean, yeah. look, so, this is neither targeted nor random. So, my question is yeah. uh, maybe your results could also be explained if the attacks are, have a spatial temporal structure instead of uh, being. Targeted. Yeah, we, we, we only, I think I also brought it that way, we only tested two models. So, showing it's not a random attack. Actually, that's what I showed. It's not random. But what it is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it can be as many models of how to make the damage as you, as you like. And um, the data themselves are pretty noisy because different brains are pretty different. Mm -hmm. and, um, but targeted looks like a good description. We're now looking at the moment just trying modularity mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as a parameter to describe Alzheimer's networks. Because uh, Obviously, it looks like Alzheimer brains are less modular than healthy brains. Mm -hmm. um, so, we're, we're trying to find the best variable to, to describe. Uh, as far as you know, that's okay. as far as you know, in MCI patients, uh, EEG recordings show an increase in PLI in the in the lower alpha map, right? Yeah. You showed that synchronization is uh, yeah, really. increase in other bands. How is the, is the talk between bands? Do you see a pattern that some kind of a spectrum goes to another part of the... Of the, of the yeah, there is, with Alzheimer's, there is a general slowing, right? So right. everything goes... Uh, like what with all, well, a slowing, you mean in the alpha band, right? Well, in all bands. In, in, in all of them. Uh, everything gets slower, so mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit tricky to talk about. But what is, my question would be, what is enhanced? What synchronization is enhanced and what is decreased? No, well, it looks uh, like um, the mild cognitive impairment group is really different from the Alzheimer's group. <laughs> so, in, but correct me if I'm wrong, because you've done more MCI than I have. No, it's perfect, you're right. It's yeah. completely different yeah. groups. A mild cognitive brain has higher synchronization yeah. and Alzheimer has lower synchronization. So at some point, if you go from MCI to Alzheimer, you have to be normal. <laughs> 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 yes. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, what is the this thing? I always surprised to, to hear about the alpha band, the beta band. I, I have no idea if this has really some physiological reason or was some historical a technical uh, reason to separate the brain activity in those, uh, in those months. My question is, 
if you, you analyze correlations and likelihoods and all that, analyzing, uh, separating the signal into bands and then analyzing them, yeah. is, is, is this sensible or is it better to analyze the full signal without filtering it and, and see how it correlates? Yeah. What is the, uh, the reason for the splitting in bands? Okay, two reasons. First of all, very practical one. If you take all the frequencies, you obviously see less differences. And you can argue, yeah, of course, I have more parameters, so it's a bigger chance that I find something different. Uh, but yeah, in, in general, you see a difference between high frequencies and lower frequencies. That's one. Then the other question that you then should ask is how sure are you that where there exactly the borders between different bands are? Well, most of this is actually pretty much based on physiolog physiological measurements in animals. So, for instance, um, we know that if you record in uh, hippocampus and parahippocampal areas, you get these theta rhythms there. So, the cells there that give you theta rhythms. Um, we also know that if you disconnect the cortex, that cortex will start to oscillate, also in, in, in low frequencies, typically in, in the delta. Area. And we know from animal experiments that if you want to, uh, to to bring information from one region to another region, very much of that information transfer is in the higher frequencies in beta band. Uh, the exact borders are, it's, it's very difficult to judge. I think the alpha rhythm is a good example. You know, it's a very prominent rhythm. You know that if you get older, that rhythm changes. So having one hard border saying this is the alpha band for everybody makes no sense. Um, but on the other hand, if you do group comparisons, you can hope that uh, these sort of individual variations cancel out. Does this answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Among the biochemical studies of the mechanisms of Alzheimer, is there any uh, mechanism being discussed which could explain these targeted attacks of uh, Alzheimer's? Yeah. Yes. Oh, so this. Do we have another hour? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's, there's, um, there's been a number of studies. But I'll, first of all, I think most people would agree that if you say Alzheimer's disease, they are actually talking about a, a range of different underlying disease mechanisms. Some Alzheimer's diseases are genetic, and others seem not to be so genetic. One particular interesting thing is that uh, there are particular enzyme deficiencies. If you have those, you are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, these, but it looks like there is actually, there, within the Alzheimer's group, there, there's two behaviors. You can either start to deteriorate quite early, but then the, the, the process goes quite slowly. Or you start off later, but then your capabilities drop much quicker. So if, um, I don't never know what would be, but you're better off without any of those two. <laughs> <laughs> the other ones I would be a bit skeptical to choose between. But it looks like this, so this late onset, but severe, is one that is um, uh, related to enzyme deficiencies. So, uh, and, and the, the milder one, which starts quicker, and you're 50 or a little bit older, but goes very slowly, seems not to be related to these biochemical properties. Well, okay, I think we have time for a coffee break, and then we continue with the second one. Thanks again.